Jump right in. We have been doing a series called O oh, Taste and See That the Lord is Good. David made this comment and we went through and we were offering different uh, courses of uh, a banquet meal that I had served a few weeks earlier. And from uh, O oh, Taste and See, Psalm 34, we've jumped over to Psalm 103. And in Psalm 103, David goes on to say, uh, Praise the Lord, my soul, all of my innermost being, praise his holy name. Verse 2, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. That psalm that Pastor Steve read this morning during the worship, I thought, dude, if you keep going, you're going to steal my sermon. Isn't it great when the Holy Spirit just works things together, hey? I love it. I love it. Last week, I preached to you from verse 3, the very first part of verse 3, after David says, and don't forget all of God's benefits. Look, when you experience the benefits of God, you have tasted and you have seen that the Lord is good. And so we, we paired these two psalms up together because it's about tasting and seeing. David says, now that you have tasted, don't forget the benefits of the Lord. So on the one hand, he says to those who have never tasted, come on, taste and see that God is good. After people have tasted, he says, come on. Praise the Lord and don't forget his benefits. Don't forget what you have tasted and what you have seen. And last week, I spoke about uh, the first part of verse 3. David lists the first of the benefits. He says, who forgives me of all of my sins. Or actually, it's written, he forgives all your sins. He forgives all your sins. And I put quite a bit of emph emphasis last week on the forgiveness of God. How God forgives us so completely, so utterly, to the max. And he doesn't hold the stigma over our heads of the things that we've done wrong. He doesn't hold it as a memory or as a shadow or as a dark moment. The Bible says that as far as the east is from the west and the heavens, uh, as high as the heavens, and I shared with you last week that science is still discovering new galaxies. That's how far God has removed our sins from us. That's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. In fact, sometimes, you know, we stumble in a similar occasion where we've stumbled in the past. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? And uh, this one fellow was heard praying in church one time, Oh Lord, please forgive me again of my sin. And suddenly a booming voice from the heavens came and said, What do you mean again? I don't remember the last time. That word sin, and I'm going to go on to the next part of this verse, but I want to share the Hebrew for the word sin because when I tie up this sermon this morning, you should be jumping and hooping and hollering because you're going to see an amazing truth come together. But that word sin, when David says, who forgives? God forgives all of your sins, all of our sins. That word sin in the Hebrew is avon, avon. And it means iniquity, guilt, faults, sin, the punishment for iniquity. Okay? The punishment for iniquity. Uh, just forget that last line. That's part of the next, uh, the second half of the verse. He heals all your diseases. But uh, so sin is iniquity, guilt, fault, sin. It even includes the punishment 
or the consequences of our sin. Did you know that when God forgives you of your sin, if you truly have repented, he wants to break the consequences as well. The repercussions. Sometimes we, we, we catch on by faith to the fact that God will wash our sins away and we're actually clean. But we need to catch on to everything that God can do. Because God is never definable by one dimension. He is only definable by a dimension of infinity. And so when he forgives us of all of our sin, he even forgives us from the curse. He redeems us from the curse of the consequences of our sins. I don't know about you. But that was just a really good preach and a phenomenal point. I may not be shouting, but that doesn't mean you don't have to shout. He goes on and all in the same verse, verse 3, he says, Who forgives us of all of our sins and heals all of our diseases. Now, I find it interesting to the point where it makes me inquire of the Lord why that verse, those two subjects are all tied up in one verse. He forgives me of all of my sins and heals all of my diseases. And I just shared with you that avon means sin, fault, iniquity, even the consequences of your sin. Well, I want to show you why David includes these things together. I want to introduce you to the God that we don't hear about often enough and the God that we need to see regularly in our daily lives. Stay with me. Don't throw rocks at me yet. I'm not preaching a false doctrine, and I'm not preaching another God. I'm just preaching about another side of God. Hello? And some of you, the jury is still out. Okay. That's all right if the jury is still out. Just don't stone me yet. All right? <laughs> uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. I want you to understand the context, the broad context of what I'm about to read. The Hebrew people are about to have just been released from Egypt. They had been in Egypt for 400 years. For 100 years, there were citizens in Egypt. There was a great famine, and Joseph, who was second in command under Pharaoh, his family had sold him off, his brothers, actually. They were jealous of him. And there was a drought in the land, and now his brothers, thinking he was dead or some miserable little slave somewhere, came to Egypt because Egypt, through God's intervention, had stored up grain and feed for seven years. And so um, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt to get feed. And uh, they then found the redemption of God in that their brother was saved and the same way God had given Joseph dreams when he was a young man that made his brothers hate him. The dreams were that his brothers and even his parents would one day, one day bow down to him. And he was sold off as a slave and God said, no, that's not how the story goes. And he raised Joseph up to be second in command of all of Egypt. And Joseph was an interpreter of dreams. He was a man of the Spirit of God. He saw visions. You know, it makes me so sad that today people think the gifts of the Holy Spirit aren't for today. Hey, they were for the Old Testament. And we have more of Christ and more of the Holy Ghost today than they ever had because we are actually sanctified by the real blood of the Lamb of God. Can I get an agreement? Amen. And so Joseph dreamed, he had visions, he heard the Spirit of God and understood. I pray that every one of you 
would have visions in the Holy Ghost, that you would understand the dreams from God, and that you would prophesy, and that you would lay hands on the sick and see the miraculous power of God. Let me make it quite clear. I do not want to lock up the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the person of Rob Scarallo because we got to make him the great evangelist. No, I'm here to be the coach to show the children of God that there is more to our Father and more to our walk with the Holy Spirit and more that is accessible to us through the name of Jesus Christ. Can I get agreement here today, church? Come on now. Amen. And so they, his brothers were taken into Egypt and all of their families and they grew and they multiplied. But before they were was a man named Abraham. And all of them are descendants of Abraham. And the Bible says that Abraham had tremendous faith in God. In a time of um, multi-deism, when people were worshiping multiple gods, they had a God to cover every angle of life. God believed in Yahweh. Jehovah. And God reckoned it to Abraham that he had such tremendous faith in him. And God said, I will grow your seed into a great nation. So I want you to understand the context of all of this. Because of Abraham's relationship and faith, his trust, his confidence in the character of God, a great nation started to grow. They started as a small family of Joseph's brothers and sisters and his mom and dad. They came into Egypt. That's how they were there. For the first 100 years, they were fellow citizens with Egyptians. They had a, an open-door immigration policy. And then after 100 years, Joseph was forgotten about. He had passed away. And one of the new pharaohs said, you know, these, these Hebrews are becoming too numerous and if we don't do something, they're going to be more than us. And we need to make them slaves. And so all their rights and privileges were taken away progressively over a period of time. Hmm, that'll preach. <laughs> and uh, let me not be sidetracked. Uh, and, and so they became slaves. And for 300 years, they were under the whip. Today, we'd say they were under the gun. They were under the whip, literally. God heard their cries and said, I'm going to bring you out from the oppression that you're in, and I'm going to be your God. And uh, I have people over here in a land called Canaan, many different tribes and nationalities, and I've been trying to reach them for the longest time, and they have sinned dreadfully. And now I want to cleanse the earth of them, and I'm going to bring you into the land they once possessed, but I want you to trust me. So here are these thousands upon thousands of Hebrews coming out of Egypt. A lot of Bible scholars estimate from what is written in scriptures that there was something like three million Hebrews that came out of Egypt. And they went through the wilderness following Moses, and God performed many signs and wonders. But being slaves such as they were, they didn't have the same relationship with God that Abraham had. They were because of Abraham's faith. But they didn't come into a first-hand relationship with this God. They followed signs and wonders but never took the time, many of them, in fact, that whole first generation, never truly put their trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they just looked for the miracles, feed me another tidbit. But they never devoted their lives to him. And the Bible says that whole first generation was lost in the wilderness. And God took the second generation in. One of the things that happened early after they came out of Egypt, they started to complain to Moses. They, were, they, they came to a, a water source, and as some of them jumped down into the water and quickly started to drink, they found that the water 
was very bitter to taste, but worse than that, it caused a lot of cramping, maybe even dysentery. And they became sick and fell sick, and they started to cry out to Moses and said, you brought us out of Egypt to kill us. We were better off as slaves. We were better off in Egypt. That would be the equivalent of a born-again Christian saying, I was better off when I was under the kingdom of darkness. I mean, it was reprehensible what they were saying. They didn't understand what they were inherited, and they didn't understand the God who was leading them and loving them. He didn't call them because they were great. He called them because he's great, just like us. He didn't call us because we're great. He called us because he's great. Amen. Absolutely. And as we learn to believe in him, he will make us great. He will cause us to reflect his greatness. Yeah, because right from the beginning, God's intention was always that man would be made and carry the image and the likeness of God. Did I say something earlier about salvation is Jesus bringing everything back to the way it was supposed to be before the fall? He's restoring and reinstituting his church through that born again process. Gee, it's so good to see you every week. Thank you. Good. <laughs> One of our snowbirds. <laughs> yeah, it's great seeing you. Restoring us back to who we were supposed to be before the fall. So here are these people, they're starting to get to know this God that Moses was telling them about. So they were the equivalent to. Very baby, carnal Christians. Now, I don't know where you are in your walk with Jesus, and it really doesn't matter. What does matter is that you keep walking with Jesus. It's like I I often say, I don't care where you've come from. Your past isn't a problem. I don't care what he has saved you from. I want to be here to help you so that you will walk to where you've never been. Amen. Absolutely. (laughs) And so these people start to accuse Moses and they're angry at Moses and Moses goes and he prays and God says, Moses, they're not angry at you, they're angry at me. Grace and Faith Bible College 101, first lecture, chain of command. When God establishes leadership, they represent him to the point where when we attack them, God says, they attacked me. Very important principle, never preach to the church because too many people would leave and go to the next church. Okay, chain of command, very important. But you won't, you won't make it through the army without learning chain of command. Okay? Some of us that are a little bit older have a few more great hairs and less hairs and less teeth. We, we, we grew up on this stuff. We understand chain of command. There is a chain of command in the Word of God. And uh, in this cancel culture, we don't want authority. We don't want anything that represents authority because we are rebellious by nature. And everybody in the church says, Jesus, we want revival. Amen, a Holy Ghost revival, praise God. And so God says to Moses, he said, I'm going to show them who I am yet again. And God says to Moses, I want you to take this branch, this limb of a tree, and throw it in the water. And immediately the water became sweet. It healed the water. Now, in Bible college, in first year, we teach them about types. There are many types in the Old Testament, and a type is a picture, a figurative picture, a scenario, a story, an illustration, a miracle, sometimes a person, sometimes an institution that pictures and mirrors a spiritual reality. So here the people were sick, Because of the bitter water, 
they were going to die because there was no other water and the curse was put on this wooden limb and thrown into the water and the water was healed, it became sweet and the people were able to drink. And it is symbolic of Jesus Christ dying on a wooden tree, a cross, and becoming the curse so that our lives can be sweet. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might be the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ. He knew no sin. I knew a lot of sin. But he became me so I could become him because it is always God's intention to have man in his image. Hallelujah. We are born again because my birth the first time birthed me into a fallen Adam, but my birth the second time births me into the last Adam. And the same way I bore the likeness of the first Adam, now I bear the likeness of the last Adam. Hallelujah. At the end of that story, verse 26, Exodus chapter 15, God then introduces himself to these Hebrew people who did not have the same relationship with him that their great, 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 great granddaddy Abraham had. So God kept introducing himself, and this is what he says in verse 26. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commandments, And keep all his decrees. I will not bring on you any of the diseases that I brought on the Egyptians. When God was taking them out of Egypt, he allowed the curse to come upon them. And and God is saying, you won't see any of that stuff. For I am. See, Moses said, God, when I go tell these people that You're going to set them free. Who do I tell them is sending me? And God said, tell them, I am that I am. And here God is introducing another side of who he is. And he says, I am the Lord who heals you. I am Yahweh Yahweh Rapha. The Hebrew word for heal is Rapha. I am the God who heals you. I am Jehovah Rapha. Can I have the word? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, I don't even have to press a button. You guys all have touch screen at home. I have say so. <laughs> I just say so and it's there. <laughs> thank you. You're making me look good. <laughs> Keep it up. Awesome. All right. So David says, he heals me of all my diseases. And in Psalm 103, verse 3, point, uh, B, the last part of verse 3, when it says he heals all my diseases, it says Rapha in the Hebrew manuscripts. In Exodus 15, verse 26, when God says, for I am the Lord who heals you, it's Rapha. This is one of the compound names of Yahweh or Jehovah. I am the Lord, Yahweh, your shepherd. I am the Lord, your healer. And so God is revealing himself to the Hebrew people so that they would know the God of their great, 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 great granddaddy and not live on the hearsay of who he is, but live on the revelation and the experience of who he is. Can I get an amen? So I want to show you something really cool because I've heard some theologians (laughs) want to argue the fact that healing isn't in the atonement. The atonement is the price that Jesus paid for the consequences of sin. Well, I want to tell you that before Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't have sickness. 
One of the consequences of the fall of humanity, one of the consequences is sickness. Gee, that sounds synonymous with what God said to the Hebrew children in Exodus 15. If you obey me, if you follow my decrees, if you do what is right, if you don't slip in a sin, none of those curses will come on you. Wow. So let's have a look at a scripture that Isaiah prophesies about the Messiah who would atone. That means he will pay the price. He will atone. He will pay the price through a blood sacrifice for all of our sin. That's what atonement is. Jesus atoned for us. He became the price to make everything right again. So we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Now Isaiah is prophesying about the Messiah that was to come. People aren't going to follow him because he's full of charisma. People aren't going to follow him because he'd make an excellent male model. People aren't going to follow him because he looks like Pastor Rob Scarello. <laughs> Wait a minute, you didn't laugh at anything else I said, now you're laughing? I agree with you, I'm laughing too. People aren't going to follow him because he's built like Tom Brady. There's nothing about him in the natural that we would desire him. He's unassuming. He's not what we would list as a runway male model. That's what the Bible says. There's nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Next verse. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. I'm going to tell you that the very first thing Jesus carried on his life from the moment he was born was rejection. There was a dual purpose to the virgin birth. One, because if he was born of man and woman, he would have imputed into himself through the first Adam a sin nature. He had to come without a sin nature. And so God used just one part of the DNA. And by his Holy Spirit, he impregnated her so that a God-man would come like the first Adam before the fall. Are you with me? The second reason why there was a virgin birth was because the first curse that came on man when he fell and sinned was rejection. There was separation between man and God. And so, if Jesus is going to atone, he has to pay the price. He has to become as if he's the one who's going to bear all the consequences of everything that came on humanity through the first Adam. To reverse the order of the first Adam, the last Adam came carrying all the consequences but lived without sin. And he became the scapegoat on the cross so that he takes everything that we deserve and everything we are and all the sins that Rob Scarallo's ever dabbled in and we become who he is, the righteousness of God. 
by faith. He became cursed so we could be free from the curse. So he was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Surely, now listen, this is where it really kicks in. Surely, he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He took up our pain. I want you to look at the word pain. If we go to the Hebrew here, pain is Chloe, Chloe, and it comes from uh, 2470. I use the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It allows me to look up any scripture, and if it's Old Testament, I could go back to the Hebrew word and see what was written in the original manuscripts. And if it's a verse from the New Testament, I could go back to the Greek. And so this is what we do, and these are the reference numbers. Malady, anxiety, calamity, disease, grief, sickness. Everyone repeat after me. Malady, anxiety, calamity, disease, grief, sickness. He not only bore on himself the curse of malady, these are all the things that came on the world because the first Adam surrendered himself to the king, kingdom of darkness. He not only took on himself malady, which is sickness, he took on anxiety. You have emotional issues. You have issues that affect your mind, that cause you anxiety, fears, phobias, stress, Depression, I want you to understand that Jesus, who knew no sin, paid the price, and by pay, paying the price, he became the scapegoat. In other words, everything that hell could vomit up and has vomited up on humanity, Jesus said, I'm going to let all that vomit be on me, and I'm going to crucify it on the cross so that the curse is broken. And I'm going to change places with you on the cross. I will become you. I will become all of your sin. I will become all of your shame. I will become all of your guilt so that you can become who I am in the Father, curse-free, blessed, resurrected, redeemed, the righteousness of God. That's why, church, we read in Ephesians, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And Paul, yeah, 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 amen. And Paul goes on to say, now watch this because we don't often catch this. Paul goes on to say, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, right? So that means there are hundreds of thousands, millions of seats in heavenly places and we're all sitting around Jesus. No, there's one throne. It says, Paul goes on to say, and he's the head and we're the body. And the enemy in the kingdom of darkness is under his feet. You know what that tells me? If you think about it, if you visualize the scripture, you're sitting in the same seat he's sitting in. You see, the first Adam, if he did not sin, would have reproduced in his likeness, which was in the likeness of God. And Lucifer understood that if he was going to strike, he had to strike before there was a firstborn. And so he struck Adam and Eve before they reproduced and caused them to fall and have a fallen nature so that everything they reproduce has a fallen nature. So God sends the last Adam and tells you you must be born again because when you are born again the same way you bore the likeness of the first Adam, now you bear the likeness of the last Adam. So Jesus became 
everything you and I were and every curse we deserve and every consequence, the penalty of our sins, he became it all on the cross. And the cross is the place of exchange. It's where heaven meets earth and God's power of transformation takes place. He becomes who we were and what we deserved and we become who he is and what he deserves. Yes! Talk about a plan to turn the kingdom of darkness upside down and on its ear and kicked in the butt. Fortunately, most of this stuff never gets preached in church because how much can you do inside of 60 minutes? I got news for you. This isn't a news program, so I'm not doing 60 minutes. It says, surely he took up our pain, malady, anxiety. I don't care if it's in your body or in your emotions or in your mind. Calamity. You think you're a curse waiting to happen? You're a failure waiting to happen? You're a problem waiting to happen? You're a disaster waiting to happen? Calamity! He came to break that curse off of your life. That is a curse from demons. It is not the blessing of God. The blessing of God is Jesus Christ and he became my calamity. So I become a son of heaven, hallelujah. Yes, yeah. Preach it, baby. (laughs) I don't know why I said it, it just felt good. Surely he took up our pain and our suffering. Look at the word for suffering. Suffering. Makob. Pain. Physical. Physical. From 3510, it includes anguish or figurative affliction, pain, and sorrow. But the actual word makob means pain, physical pain. Don't tell me that Jesus didn't die. People say, yeah, that verse, by his stripes we are healed, doesn't really refer to physical healing. Our healing's not in the atonement. Physical pain is, malady is, calamity is, anxiety is, disease is, Pain. It says, surely, 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 without a doubt, without a question, he took it on. If he took it on, you don't have to take it on. If he took it on, somebody paid the price for it. I refuse to pay a price that Jesus already paid for me. And I refuse not to believe in the work that Jesus did for me. Surely he bore our pain and our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God and stricken by God and afflicted by God. But he was pierced for our transgressions. The next part of the verse says, he was pierced for our transgressions. Verse 5. Let's look at the word transgressions. The Hebrew word is pesha. Transgressions, rebellion, sin, trespass. Anyone ever fall into one of those categories? Raise your hand if you fell into one of those categories. And if you didn't raise your hand, you're rebellious and you just fell into that category. (laughs) Just messing with you. I know you know that you're a dirty, rotten scoundrel just like I was. 
But if you're born again, you're not a dirty, rotten scoundrel. I was a sinner saved by grace. Now, I am a son of God. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. <laughs> it, it irks me. So many Christians say, well, uh, I'm a sinner saved by grace. What? I was a sinner saved by grace. Today, I am a co-heir with Jesus Christ. Co-heir, equal, equal inheritance. That's why we are seated in heavenly places with him. He's the head, we're the body. So many Christians think we're the detached body. Here's the head in this throne. We have smaller thrones and here the rest of the bodies. He doesn't have a headless body. So if he's the head and we're the body, I'm sitting in the same throne together with him. Can you, can you fathom such love? Can you fathom that a God would love people so much that he would want to redeem them to such a degree that he would become flesh and become the epitome of all of their sin and carry on his back the consequences of all of our stupidity. And sometimes there's some stupidity in there. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, I don't want you to say that's how it is. I want you to say that's how it was. That's how it was. Can you fathom a God who could love us? Can I stand on the seat next to you? I know most gentlemen ask you if they could sit next to you. I want to stand next to you. He became who we were so that we can be restored back into the image of the Most High God. I'm not a schlep. I'm not a loser. I'm not a has-been. I am that I am because of Jesus Christ, and I am growing from glory to greater glory. Can I get an agreement here this morning? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You see, once Lucifer was this beautiful Glorious angel, the Bible says he was the most beautiful of all angels. But he rebelled. Tyranny was in his heart. And when you fall, you become the opposite of what you were. That's what happened to the first Adam. That's why we're saved. Most preachers have convinced everybody that all you got in your salvation was God took out his eraser and erased all the little notes about everything you've ever done wrong. So you got a clean piece of paper and he gives you a ticket, you could go to heaven. That's the gospel of forgiveness. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. In the kingdom, we are sons. We are heirs. In the kingdom, we rule and reign in this life through one, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise God. You see, this is so mind-boggling that Paul even says it was mind-boggling for demons. Do you know that in Corinthians, Paul actually says, if the rulers of this age had understood what God was going to do, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The devil and all of his demons using those Roman soldiers with their nine pound hammers banging the nails into Jesus' hand again and again, his feet. And they thought, yes, we got rid of him. And God in heaven is going, yes. Unless a seed falls to the ground, it cannot reproduce. My son will die so that there will be millions of them. Yes! Yes! What an amazing gospel. That's my excuse for going down so many bunny trails. It's too excitable to stick to one subject. He was pierced, the nails, 
his feet, his side. He was pierced because of my transgressions, because of my rebellion, because of my sin, and because of all the ugly, dirty stuff I'm glad you're never going to know about. You could say amen to that for yourself too. Don't let me feel so lonely up here. <laughs> it goes on to say, the punishment that brought our peace was on him. Her or me? God bless you. The punishment that brought our peace It just talked about physical healing, mental healing, emotional healing. It just talked about those things being the result of our transgression, rebellion, sin, and trespass so that he could bring us peace. And then theologians want to wrap up this word peace and it's just a, a nice little feeling. Hmm. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. If America was under attack and they were shooting rockets into this nation and nuclear weapons were being unleashed, would America be experiencing a time of peace? Now understand, you can have peace in the midst of the conflict like Jesus had in the middle of a storm. I get it. But if we read the context... And he's talking about all the ramifications of the fall. Then why do we isolate peace only to mean having this warm, fuzzy little feeling while our life is going to wreck and ruin? No, peace means, by the way, anyone watched the news this morning? Any nuclear missiles on their way here? Any rockets on their way here? Because at the moment, we have peace. You see, our peace is on him. God wants you to live in a place where you can rest under the blessing of God, free from the assails and the attacks of the enemy. Peace isn't just a warm, fuzzy feeling. Peace is having that shield of faith and all the fiery darts of the enemy because you know who you are in Jesus Christ. They hit that thing and fall to the ground. They hit that thing and fall to the ground. They come and hit you in the head. You got the helmet of salvation. That helmet screams, no, sir, no, sir. Uh-uh, you're not coming here, devil. No, I'm not accepting those thoughts. No, I am not condemned. I am the redeemed of the Lord. The helmet of salvation shouts constantly who I am in Jesus Christ. And the shield of faith shouts constantly the promises of God are mine. The promises of God are mine. Hallelujah. The punishment that brought our peace was on him. And by his wounds, let's put the word up there, by his wounds, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. Let's look at the word wounds. I like this word. Kabura. Kabura, by the stripes. Now remember, atonement means he brought on himself and paid the price on himself for everything that was supposed to be on us. Okay? So by his kabura, the stripes, 39 lashes, the blows, the black and blue, and the bruises. Hmm. Hang on, the prophecy's coming to mind. Oh, that's right. At the moment man fell, God enters the scene. 
And everyone's pointing this way. And God says, Eve, the seed of the serpent, him and all of his demons will bruise your seed. Bruise. And the descendants of mankind that were meant to bear my image will now bear the consequences of your sin and your fall. But you will have a seed and he will bruise the serpent's head. Atonement. Jesus became bruised and took on himself everything that was unleashed on the earth the day Adam and Eve left their guard. And Jesus took it all on the cross. And he allowed his heel to be bruised. But I got news for you. That cross, the principalities would never have crucified Christ if they had understood what the Lord of glory was about to do. Because as they successfully put him to death, they successfully set us free. (laughs) As they ended his life, they began ours. Hallelujah. By his stripes, I am healed. By his stripes, I am redeemed. By his bruises, the enemy is crushed. Hallelujah. Ephesians, raised up, heavenly places, chapter 1, verse 19, 20, 21. And we are seated with him. He is the head, we are the body, and all the powers of darkness are under his feet. You're the body. He's the head. He'll always be the head. Don't try to be the head. I have enough trouble being the body. Don't try to be the head. He's the head. There's only one Jesus Christ, but there are many sons of God. By his wounds, let's go back one slide. By his wounds, one slide back. Okay. By his wounds, we are healed. Is that what it said, Tony? By his wounds, we are healed. Let's look at the Hebrew word for healed. By his wounds, we are healed. Healed. 7495 Rafa. To mend by stitching, to cure, to heal, to repair, to make whole. That's God's name. That's who God introduced himself to the sons of Abraham. Guess what? Not all those that are born of the biological seed are Abraham's seed. But those who are born again by the promise are Abraham's seed. God is still revealing himself to Abraham's seed. He is the Lord Yahweh Rapha who heals. And on the cross, he paid the price for your healing and for every effect of the fall. And he brought us into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ. Now, if you believe that, and if you want to get happy that you just got rapha by Rapha himself, stand up and give the Lord a shout. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on! Yes, 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 yes! 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 You know, that atonement prophecy ends 
with us being in the same position as the name of God, the Lord who heals. We are the healed of the Lord. We bear his image. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, during my lifetime, I have had five incurable diseases. That's what the doctors told me. I decided I am not going to bear the image and the stamp of my adversary when I can bear the image and the stamp of my Savior. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. God's a healer. He stitches things together. He cures, he heals, he repairs, he makes whole. That's mentally, emotionally, physically. If we let him, if we keep hanging on to who he is and trust him. Now listen. The reason why not everything happens instantly is because I am not always in the place of agreement instantly. Sometimes in my mind I agree. I see the logical connection. I can follow the progression. Here's the biblical argument. I get it. But sometimes in my soul, I have images of me that keep telling me, you don't deserve it. I have images of that speak rejection to me. And before I stepped into a lot of the healing that I walk in now, healed of incurable things, I had to get that image of me healed because my soul was in disagreement with the Word of God. With my head, I could say yes, but in my emotions and in my memories, I had a picture of Rob Scarallo. God wouldn't heal him. And as I allowed God to work in my emotions, my confidence and my faith went not only to my mind of reason, but it also went to my mind of emotions. And my soul came into agreement with my spirit, and my spirit came into agreement with the Word of God, which is always in agreement with the heart of God. I know on this topic, people have got a lot of questions. I have one answer. By his stripes, we were healed. Every one of us, our lives are mapped differently. I can't bring an answer to every person's situation because we're all in different places. There are things that I believed and prayed for healing for well over 20 years. And finally, finally, one day, it only happened two years ago. For well over 20 years, I would get these abscesses in the most awkward of places. Many of you know the story. It was a lingering result of the incurable disease I had called Crohn's. It was a result due to the surgical process they did to remove some of the abscess. They couldn't heal it. God healed me. But I'd get these abscesses in my butt. And after, well after 20 years, one day as I'm praying, God said, do you remember? I mean, this all came in a nanosecond, instantly. It's like I had what will take me two minutes to tell you, he told me in one second. He said, you remember when you were in the hospital and they did that procedure to drain the abscess? Uh-huh. He said, you remember how you joke when you're in pain? Uh-huh. And you remember how they kept every day pulling the gauze out of the hole that they made inside your body 
that was stuck to the sides of the flesh on the inside and they had to keep pulling it out like a wick so that it would absorb all the pus and finally remove the wick. Do you remember how you used to scream? I said, yeah. You remember how you used to joke? Yeah. And you remember how you used to say, it is a pain in my... So I'm going to prove to you, if you repent, that every time you said it, it would bring it on. I saw all of this in a nanosecond. I didn't realize. I, I, I literally said, now I know what that phrase means. This is literally a pain in my... EB. I repented on the spot over 20 years. Over 20 years, the irritation, it would wake me up in the middle of the night. I can't tell you how many times. I would get one every three to six weeks without what I found, every three to six weeks. Over 20 years, I had this. In one second, God brings me back to a moment where I opened the door and I sinned. I thought I was being the funny guy. I repented. It's two years I've never had one. Amen. Now, I can't tell you I have any witnesses because I don't go mooning anybody. But I can tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm glad you're willing to take my word. I've been absolutely healed. Totally, totally. Sometimes, not all the time. Sometimes when we're pursuing that healing, we've got to say, okay, Lord, is there a reason? Did I open a door? Is there something I need to repent of? Remember Exodus 15, God said, if you follow my ways, obey my decrees. Now, we're not going to become a bunch of air-filled heads that every time somebody say we're going to say oh there must be sin in your life don't be so crass we're all mapped so differently don't try to make one size fit all but I will confess I had to deal with something in my heart I wish I had gotten the revelation a lot sooner I wouldn't have had that pain in my, and I realized I don't say it anymore. I mean, I don't even say half of it. I did today. I don't even say that phrase anymore. I refuse to say it. And I have been free. Sometimes we don't realize we open little doors that allow the enemy to come in. This is what I know. God's name is the Lord. Rafa. That's his name. That's who he is. In Psalm, uh, Isaiah 53, he was wounded. He was bruised. He was beat up. He was pierced for all the consequences of the fall so that we can be healed. Rafa. Do you realize that that's just another dimension of becoming made in His image. Salvation, it includes it all. Amen. Amen. The most important healing is the healing of relationship. The Bible says that every one of us is lost without hope. But if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, He will come in. And He will make things right. And that price He paid, that atonement, gets credited to our account. If you have never asked Jesus in your heart, look, don't tell me about how many times you've been to church. That doesn't do it. Don't tell me about how many times you've listened to Pastor Rob on Facebook. That doesn't do it. Keep listening, but that won't 
get you saved. You have to have a personal relationship with God by coming to that place of the cross. And you say, I realize you did all that because of my mistakes. And I'm taking ownership. I'm not going to wear it. You're willing to wear it. I'm taking ownership. You died for me. I put you on that cross. Forgive me of all my sins. Since you're willing to pay the price, I receive you into my heart. Every eye closed right now. If you have never done that, and you're willing to do that today, I want to introduce you to the God who has many names. He's not just a healer. He's a savior. He's a forgiver. He's a sanctifier. He's our righteousness. He's our peace. He's our hope. Right now. Would you raise your hand and say, I want to ask Jesus in my heart. Come on. Come on, raise your hand and say, that's me, preacher. One, two, thank you. You put your hand down. Three, thank you. God bless you. Who else? Raise your hand. Don't be afraid. Raise your hand and say, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior, as my Lord. I want to receive him right now. Praise God. That's awesome. Three people today are going to start a journey with Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Tell them how proud you are of that. Amen. Amen. I want everyone, especially those of you who just raised your hands, but everyone, repeat this prayer after me. This is how we ask Jesus into our heart. But I'd like to have a choir of everyone praying it. And those of you who raised your hand, God, he already saw your hand. If I saw it, he saw it. And God's going to atone and forgive and set you free. Repeat after me, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me so much. I didn't deserve it. I deserved what you got. But you traded places with me. And today, I welcome you to come into my life and live inside me. Take over the steering wheel. I give you access to all of my life. Jesus Christ, I believe you are God. And you died on that cross for me. And I say yes. I receive it and I welcome you into my life. Thank you for forgiving me and thank you for this spiritual birth that's happening right now. I thank you, Father, that today, because of Jesus Christ, my sins, my past, the curse on my life, is broken because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I receive him as my Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, church, if you're excited that three people just received Christ as their Savior, let them know. Let them know. Amen. 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 And for those of you who did raise your hand, tell a friend, especially one that knows Christ. They will be so excited. And they will help you and feed you in your Christian walk. Awesome. And to all of you, I want you to know the Lord Rapha, Yehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh. He is the God who stitches together, he heals, makes whole, he cures, he completes. Amen. One last time, let's give the Lord a shout. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.